Testing, testing. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Alan Liu. I'm the CEO of Quintessence. Um, I want to share a little bit about what we're working on. We're a startup, so we're looking a little bit further, I guess, more far out, I guess, than what some of the previous talks have talked about. But I think um, what I'll be sharing is sort of nicely bridges two key topics that I've seen in this track so far, which is one, the continued scaling of Ethernet optics, and also the emerging world of AIML optics, as Drew talked about in the beginning. And um, I like to suggest that the, the new AIML world may perhaps necessitate a different flavor of optics than Ethernet today. So to kind of set the scene, this is, a, I think, a great overview of data center interconnects. This is from a tutorial paper by Rada, which shows various flavors of interconnects used in different distances in the data center and also outside the data center. I'd like to restrict my focus to less than two kilometers, so inside of the data center, and I'll be focusing on the choice of the wavelength grid. I'd like to also suggest that we could perhaps modify this chart to maybe account for the emergent applications of, of compute fabrics, and so that, you know, the distances may not necessarily be fully accurate according to Rob's chart, but loosely speaking, between 10 meters to 100 meters, HPC scale or cluster-like scale, and most likely, it seems, at least from our vantage point, the electrical interfaces that the optics will be interfacing with are these emerging wide and parallel chiplet interfaces, such as a bunch of wires and UCIE. And I'd like to suggest that the choice of the wavelength architecture is going to be something higher order than CWM4 today, um, most likely DWM. So we know that CWM4 has been very successful inside of the data center. The key advantage there is, you know, the wide 20 nanometer spacing allows us to have the lasers be uncooled. That's great. That allows, or that reduces power, reduces cost, enables optics at scale. If you look at the requirements for off-compute interconnects that both Drew and, and Rob talked about, um, at least from, you know, their perspective of having it both, A, carry almost 10 times more bandwidth, also, B, be 10 times more power efficient in terms of fuel joules per bit, and also having to account for maybe having to keep latencies low. It seems like Ethernet optics, as we know it today, is maybe not the ideal candidate for this application. And so making the observation that, again, the electrical interface here is most likely wide and parallel. That preserves low power and low latency. Why not make the optical interface also, or why not make the optical architecture also wide and parallel? And what we're working on is to enable that in the wavelength domain because fibers are probably more expensive and we don't want to pay for too many of them. So we'd like to cram as many in a single fiber as possible. The challenge here, I think, then becomes, you know, now we're talking 16, 32, possibly even more wavelengths. So how do you A, generate those wavelengths? How do you control them on the laser side? And also how do you track all of the wavelengths, wavelength tunable, wavelength selective elements on the PIC side as well? This is an example of a chip scale DWDM transmitter. This was a, a seminal paper from Rada back before he was with Infi, showing a 40 channel indium phosphide based um, 40 by 40 gig transmitter outputting 1.6 T in total in a single fiber. And this used 40 different tunable lasers, tunable DFEs, that were each modulated by an indium phosphate EIM and then muxed into a single fiber. And so, you know. The functionality has everything we want from a single chip. I personally don't like to work as hard as RADA, so I'm looking for ways to simplify this a little bit more. Luckily, you know, technology has kind of come along a little bit since this paper was published. I think this is around 2006. And so DWDM silicon photonics using micro rings seems like a promising technology for us to be able to shrink the pick side down. And so now we don't have to use, instead of having to use EAMs or PDs with a MUX and DMUX, we can just replace that with a single bank of micro rings, and the wavelength selectivity is embedded in there, so we can get rid of the MUX and DMUX, and it's compact and it's on silicon, so that's nice. More importantly, on the laser side, what we've been working on at Quintessence is the ability to replicate the functionality of this array of single tunable DFP lasers with just a single multi wavelength comb laser that puts out all the required wavelengths, DWDM wavelengths, that you would need for, uh, for carrying the data. But the difference is now, instead of having to pay for one additional laser and having to you know, incur that laser threshold power penalty, every time we have to add a wavelength to the fiber, we just pay for one laser for all fibers. Or sorry, one laser for all wavelengths. And 
So now it looks like the pieces are sort of in place for us to kind of simplify this uh, DWDM transmitter implementation drastically, but there's still some limitations in terms of how the technology scales, and we're interested in kind of making this, this technology platform have legs to be able to scale into the future. Um, most notably, you know, the main limitation is the silicon photonic microring resonators of a finite FSR. That means typically on an order of two terahertz, and so that means we have a limited amount of optical bandwidth to uh, jam the DWDM wavelengths in there, and that also sort of imposes an upper limit on what that maximum bandwidth achievable modulated bandwidth is due to crosstalk issues and so on and so forth. But what we realized at Quintesson was, you know, with the combination of these multi wavelength single cavity comb lasers and DWDM silicon photonics, we can enable a new architecture that leverages the best of both CWDM and DWDM and then solves the challenges that are associated with each. And so what that looks like is DWDM wavelengths over CWDM bands. And conceptually, you can think of it as we're basically taking the maximum achievable bandwidth per fiber with a CWDM4 implementation and multiplying that by whatever number of DWDM wavelengths we're choosing to use. And so the, some key things to point out are in the implementation side, within each CWDM band, we would use a single comb laser. The wavelengths actually drift together as a result of the, one of the properties of the comb lasers. And so that way, we can let the laser itself be uh, uncooled and thermally drift. And so, I, so it basically looks like a CWDM4 implementation. We would have four separate lasers. They're uncooled, we let them drift. But the difference is that out of each laser, we get many multiples of DWDM wavelengths, each of which can be a data carrier. And so that multiplies the total achievable bandwidth that would, that, uh, that's uh, achievable from this otherwise, sorry, that multiplies the total achievable, achievable bandwidth compared to the original CWDM4 implementation, which just has four lambdas. Um, and also now, so sort of another perspective is, you know, this implementation sort of allows you or offers an alternative to scaling the CWM4 paradigm that doesn't resort to using higher, higher order modulation like coherence or increasing the baud rate. You can kind of keep things wide and parallel using many more wavelengths, keep the signaling rate down per wavelength. And that way you can kind of rate match to wide and parallel electrical interfaces and keep the latency down, keep the power down, et cetera, et cetera. So these are how the Lego blocks come together for us. Again, four CWDM, CWDM bands. Within each band is an array of DWDM wavelengths. Each of those DWDM wavelength arrays generated by a multi-wavelength comb laser. That is all integrated on a single silicon photonics chip modulated by micro rings detected by silicon photonic or silicon germanium detectors. And the laser is enabled by NMR snipe, YNMR snipe quantum dots. Uh, I won't go too much into the design of the laser and the quantum dot material itself. This leverages 10 years of research from the UCSB Bowers Group. Um, if you're interested in finding more details, I have a poster in the Future Technology Symposium with a lot more comb laser data, so feel free to check that out. And the beauty of this implementation and the technology platform is it really gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of mixing and matching how many wavelengths we want to instantiate. Um, to really optimize for whatever electrical interface we're matching to. And so, in general, you can kind of think of this as, you know, the, the minimum sort of, the, the straw man for the pick, for the minimum viable pick instantiation, I guess, looks just like an FR4-like pick. But the difference is now we can just add wavelengths at will, and what that looks like on the pick side is we just add or subtract rings, and then swap out the choice of the laser. And so, there's flexibility in terms of you know, adding wavelength bands. We're choosing to start with CWDM4 bands to leverage the existing work that has been done on CWDM4 filters, so we don't have to, again, do too much extra work. We also have flexibility in terms of chopping up or slicing and dicing the available spectrum within each band to allow for you know, more denser wavelengths with narrower DWDM spacing or maybe a little bit uh, cor coarser of a DWM grid. And so we demonstrated 100 lambdas by 25 gigahertz, 32 lambdas by 50 gigahertz, um, and we're currently working on eight lambdas by 200 gigahertz and 16 wavelength by 100 gigahertz spacings for the comb blazers. And so, you know, what this gives you is the flexibility to really go wide and parallel in the optical domain, or if you want, you know, go a little bit narrower and faster, depending on what the electrical interface is. 
In general, our roadmap is to kind of develop the technology platform so that we can support anywhere from eight to 32 lambdas per fiber, and signaling rates up to 112 GPAM4, and so that will give us, at the high end of that range, 3.2 terabits in a single fiber. Um, I hinted at this before, but ultimately what we'd like to drive to is to have the laser and all the other components also integrated on the same silicon tonic chip. And there's obviously advantages to doing this. You know, the first obvious one is you eliminate the coupling losses from the external laser to the silicon tonic chip. That reduces the total link loss, drives down your picojoules per bits. Reduce and simplify the fiber count so you don't have to pay for an extra pair of PM fibers between the external laser and the silicon tonic chip. And another nuanced advantage um, that's sort of related to this architecture is I mentioned that our goal is to let the lasers drift and be thermally uncooled. And when you have the laser and everything else on the same chip, it's more likely that they see the same local thermal ingredients. And so even, even, if, they make, even if there is thermal you know, uh, heating of the elements, it's most likely that they drift together. The relative drift is gonna be minimized, and so we have to work less as hard in order to track the relative frequency shift between the components. So that's another key advantage to kind of, to the, the combination of the components and the architecture. And then if you can do integrated lasers, we can take that material and make integrated amplifiers as well. So that enables us to kind of scale to new link architectures that would otherwise be unattainable um, without the ability to amplify on chip. Um, or we can just use it to increase the link margin, for example, to support lossier use cases like optical switching. So we've been hard at work prototyping some of these building block components. Um, like I said, we've demonstrated some of the comb blazers already. There's data in the poster uh, downstairs if you'd like to see it. Um, we've done some early link feasibility studies to kind of to see you know, whether we actually can build the kind of links that we want to do. So early returns indicate that we can comfortably support up to 56 gigabyte modulation per lambda based on what we've seen so far in terms of the alpha power per lambda and the REN per wavelength from the comb laser so far, and we think we have a path to get to 112 gig per lambda as well, although it'll definitely not be as easy as the other three. But in general, we think we can achieve, you know, this, all of the modulation formats shown here with very low picojoule per bit on the laser side. And TX and RX test chips are now in flights, and we're hoping to run the actual live links early next year to validate this, uh, the simulations. And so it's interesting and fun to kind of think about what you can do with this technology. I kind of want to end with maybe a slide on what I think is a, an exciting value proposition, which is sort of at the intersection of the chiplet ecosystem, AI ML interconnects, and disaggregation. And so we're, this year, you know, we've heard that UCIE has been announced and also a bunch of wires shortly after that. These are wide and parallel chiplet to chiplet interfaces that's going to deliver or promises to deliver low power, low latency connectivity between chiplets and enable mix and matching. So imagine if you, can, if you had the ability to really scale to any number of wavelengths in a single fiber and essentially instantiate any kind of optical architecture to match whatever it is on the electrical side to preserve the low latency and the low power nature of that host interface. Then you can make an optical chiplet, or sorry, if you can make an optical chiplet that does that, what you enable is you know, that chip to chip chiplet-like connectivity with low power and low latency, but the difference is that chiplet can now talk to any other chiplet all the way across the data center. And so now you can really start thinking about this aggregation really at the data center scale and you know, related to that building much larger scale out fabrics for your training clusters, so on and so forth. Uh, I missed the memo on the call to action slide, so this is my last slide, but I'll stop here and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. So you talked about um, having the, the laser side, the, the, the TR, uh, TX side uncooled. Um, but if you, ha the other end of the link is somewhere else and you've got the, the temperature difference then, uh, uh, how do you sort of deal with the, the differences? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first of all, both the TX and RX are gonna be on the same pick. It's just that there's gonna be two separate transmitter chips at different locations and you're right, they may be at different temperature temperatures. What would happen there is during the link bring, bring up, the rings will be tuned to lock to the laser wavelengths on the TX side and also on the receive signal. And then we would just thermally adjust the rings to track. Okay. 
Any other questions? Uh oh. No, it's an easy question. Okay. Uh, are the quantum dots really necessary to implement the solution, or can you do with regular quantum well uh, material? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for us, uh, from our vantage point, obviously this is totally objective, unbiased. Uh, the answer is yes, and the reason for that is, you know, the quantum dots enable the low ren nature of the multi-wavelength comb source, and we can get into the physics, but basically what it boils down to is if you try to make a multi-wavelength laser in a quantum well, um, the wavelength lines are coupled to each other, and so there's a lot of mode partition noise, and it'll be difficult to get to low noise per line, which you'll need to close these links with high fidelity. The quantum dots get around that. Um, basically, the physics is that each frequency carrier is sort of a lot more decoupled from the others as compared to a quantum well laser, and because of that, the total mode partition noise is reduced, and because of that, you can make multi-wavelength lasers that are much quieter. Maybe more physics than you wanted to hear. Okay, thank you.